Good morning and hello, everybody. Welcome to the Circular Economy and Architecture Symposium, One Day Symposium. Uh, I would like to first thank to our panelists who were so generously accepted our invitation to join today's uh, symposium. And I would like to uh, express also our uh, happiness that the, we had more than 300 registered for this uh, symposium, where the, the interest was so high from the young researchers, researchers through all over the world. And um, so with our, uh, today's uh, symposium will, uh, is organized in two sessions, the uh, morning sessions and the afternoon uh, sessions. In the morning sessions, we will have uh, three panelists, which I will uh, shortly introduce to you. And in the morning, in the, the, the first morning session is titled Circular Economy uh, Framework, Economy, Business and Design. And the afternoon sessions is the Circular Built Environment, where we will tackle the issues of education and uh, practice. Uh, first of all, let me introduce our group uh, of the Circularity and Built Environment Research Group. We are a young researchers actually, who are uh, part of the uh, design computing graduate program in ITU's Technical University. All of us are pursuing a career and, uh, and doing their PhDs in computational design uh, field. And we feel that the, this, our profession and our expertise is very important in this uh, transition from circular to uh, from linear to circular economy, where the designers and architects has to work are required to work actually with proven with the data and the uh, uh, proven evidences in uh, their methodologies in, in their approaches. So my name is Birgül Çolakoğlu. I'm professor of architecture technical university. I teach design and also computational design. And my colleagues who are in the background and who will you see at the, uh, with the green background screen on the uh, Zoom, uh, Koray Bingöl, Begüm Aktaş, and Taner uh, Üsküplü, they are, uh, with their great help and their backup support, we are going organizing this today's uh, seminar. Uh, so before I give the word to Alvise, I would like to just shortly uh, point out our view of the uh, uh, circular economy and how we actually locate ourselves in this uh, transition process as an architect and, and an architect with the uh, computational design background. Uh, so architecture, as you know, that we are so fragmented, uh, we are so, uh, um, we work in silos as designers. And the, the current era, which is uh, actually in the current era where we are facing crime, uh, climate crisis, uh, there is a need. Uh, there is a need to shift the position of the architect. So let me just uh, briefly give the uh, intro with a couple of slides to point out what how we are seeing ourselves in this uh, uh, position. Share me, let me allow to share briefly. Okay. Uh, computational designers in the age of the circular uh, economy. This is, I will just want to point out our position here. The importance, as I pointed out, the construction is this industry is the biggest pollutant of the earth now with 38% of the carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, after with the manufacturing sector. So uh, we have a great responsibility being a part of this industry, architects and designers, great responsibility to tackle these issues and to, redu to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, although some architects are still uh, treat architecture as art of paradigm art and, uh, by, uh, and the paradigm uh, arts paradigm and driven by aesthetics. Also, of course, there is a point into that, but with the current position where the world is now, we have to re really look from different aspects, our design processes, and to tackle these issues with the empowered science um, methodologies in order to contribute to the UN's 2030 sustainability and EU's Green Deal roadmap for 2050. 
So some urgent actions are actually strategies has been defined in construction industry. So like aggressively reducing energy demand in built environment, decarbonizing the power sector in implementing material strategies and reduced life cycle carbon emissions are the strategies that are urgently required to be pursued in construction industry. And although uh, the, these are the required strategies, but it is obvious that for the targets of 2030 and 40, the AEC industry will be pushed to uh, actually uh, pursue these strategies and change the, uh, its economic and business models from linear to circular. So with the challenge of climate crisis, really the industries are responding uh, by transforming their uh, strategies and business models from linear that is made on take waste uh, take make waste to strategies of design lead, uh, design lead circular economy, which is reduced, reuse and refurbish. And the, as it's pointed out that this circular economy is led by the circular design and system design, where we have to put uh, the hats in front of us as, our, as an architect and think about the really in detail what this means uh, in terms of the architecture and profession and methodologies and how we are going to tackle these issues Actually, actually contribute to the goals of the UN uh, and European Union that has been defined. And circular design actually is uh, very briefly introduced by the MacArthur Foundation as it with following three principles, eliminate waste, create carbon, uh, create products that never became waste. So the, pro the problem is that we have all the products that we are creating, including AE uh, industry, the buildings are creating a huge waste. And we have to change our way of doing this and designing this products in, in terms of not generating waste to be generate waste uh, zero uh, products. The second principle is to keep the products and materials in the use with different strategies in the closed loop. And to think third is the regenerate uh, natural systems. Shortly and briefly, so circular design uh, got, uh, targets to eliminate, circulate and regenerate by applying system thinking in architectural and design processes. And all these, the, 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 the process, the linear process of uh, business and, and producing things also in AEC industry actually causing a problem where designers are after taking their decisions are not anymore in the game in the further life cycle of their product. So change, doing, making changes is really expensive. It almost some, in many cases, almost impossible. And these products are end up with the weight. So we have to really change uh, uh, this position of the designers by empowering, by hiring the level of the designers and making, uh, making putting them in the, into decision-making positions where these old actions has been taken. So we need that improvement in the design profession. This old system, linear system, is about to transform towards the circular system where we have to deal with the system level, where the architects and designers actually are uh, very good in their profession in terms of creativity, production, and alternative generation. And we are good into that, and we are expected to be good in that, but we are not really expected to function in system level, in the macro scale, which is now required by the designers to be able to function on this the system level by the proven data and, and data-driven design, where we have to you can use uh, scientific uh, data into our processes to prove with the evidence that what we are doing actually is contributing to the reduction of the carbon dioxide emission. And as well as that is a good business model for the business businesses that are going to tackle or, or pursue this transition uh, process. So the being responsibility of architects are, are only not being producing of the product, but also being a responsible about the whole the levels of the processes. To make it short, we see as our group and the uh, 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 circularity build environment research group that designers are uh, designed and powered by science and technology is the driving force in the transition from linear to circular economy. And designers who are saving computational matters will be key actors in this transition, transition and contribute to the uh, reduction uh, of the carbon dioxide emission and sustainability of the world. 
And I will leave my uh, word here. And uh, now shortly before, trans before giving the word to Alvisa shortly, I would like to introduce our panelists, our three panelists shortly, and then I will leave the words to Alvisa. Our first panelist, Alvisa Simonetti, uh, who uh, Alvisa leads the Global Arab Explores program at Arup, which identifies and analyzes major trends impacting the future of the built environment. His background is in architecture, town planning, conservation, and computation. He also uh, supervises PhDs in the computer science department at Imperial College, London University of College. Uh, our second panelist, Arzu Donan Sorguc, is the uh, professor of professor in the Middle East Technical University Architectural Department. Her background is mechanical engineering, and he teaches um, subjects in architecture in intersection between engineering and architecture and also has taught in Delft and Pangdata Research in Delft and also Tokyo Institutes of Technology. Currently, she is also the head, the director of the design, uh, Metu Design uh, Factory. Our third panelist, Dominis Fularski, has a 25 plus years of working in the retail environment, most recently leading the circular business transformation of the global IKEA business with focus on internal and external engagement and communication development. Uh, so I would like, I welcome to all your panelists and have wish you uh, all, all of us a contributing and enjoyable symposium day. Alvise, now I leave the word, words to you. Thank you, Birgul. Uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Can you now see my slides? Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Birkul, for the opportunity to come and share uh, our experience uh, and the, uh, from the point of view of the practice uh, with this uh, um, audience, which I am thrilled to understand is made out of the new generation and the students. What you will hear from me is uh, uh, as Birgul said, I work in a in team inside this giant uh, uh, designing uh, company of 15,000 designers. I work in a team called Foresight. And what we like to do is uh, to create uh, plausible futures uh, that are alternative to what we call the official future. Uh, so uh, the official future of construction, you all know it, is called the industrialization of construction. Why can't we make houses and buildings and built environment the way we make automobiles and airplanes? And uh, we, uh, uh, you will see uh, through the examples and uh, through what I hear that uh, we talk about an alternative future of construction. This is a future of a construction that is not uh, uh, simplified to scale. Uh, uh, it is not uh, um, uh, uh, mass production, but it is, a, uh, it is a future of construction of mass customization and uh, uh, embracing complexity. Uh, so I am uh, uh, thrilled to speak about uh, uh, a circular economy or to explore circular economy, but my uh, focus and uh, uh, hence uh, my uh, uh, long-standing relation with Birgul is uh, with, uh, with computation. And, uh, and so I, uh, the presentation is around the computation and how can computation help us uh, uh, move uh, from a linear to a circular economy. And uh, uh, so the, the art, the, there are, uh, 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 Birgul and I uh, spent, uh, uh, did our studies uh, at MIT in the last millennium. And uh, uh, there, uh, Birgul did earn a PhD. Mine was uh, just a master. So just to make sure that I, I, I uh, I'm correct uh, uh, in my and what I the, uh, what what we had uh, there is during the time we were there we had a, a, a symposium similar to this one called the dimensions of sustainability in that symposium called by our um, thesis uh, advisor Professor Bill Mitchell uh, we uh, the community of uh, of uh, uh, sustain the, the sustainability community within uh, the faculty uh, was so concerned about uh, the about uh, uh, 
the computational community taking over uh, if you wish their uh, their uh, area so this uh, this behavior is the first behavior which i think uh, uh, needs to be um, removed because uh, uh, as you see from the examples that i brought to you and the experience that i uh, i'm going to bring to you it is uh, it is only when the two so the goal of a sustainable development and uh, the power of computation are together that we may have a chance to uh, change the model. So three things I want you to uh, keep an eye on during this presentation is we need to understand reality, whether it is our components at, uh, at different sc scales uh, or um, our materials, we need to uh, capture and database those materials. Otherwise, we won't uh, be able to um, to move from uh, uh, one economy to the other one. Uh, we also need to embrace generative design. Generative design has been demonstrated uh, broadly. Uh, we, uh, we think that there is a, a great opportunity uh, to, uh, to actually embrace generative design in order to, uh, uh, to, to apply um, a, a circular economy at, uh, type of design. And finally, we need to change our mind towards repurposing. Uh, and, uh, and this is a big problem in uh, uh, the entire society, but I think it is, uh, especially Western society, uh, but I think it is uh, also a specific problem in, uh, in the role of the architect and the education of the architect and the architect in society. So I'm going to show you 10 examples I uh, and uh, they are divided in building scale and the city regional scale. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, I try to cluster them, uh, and uh, uh, I I found myself uh, uh, creating this story. This is the first time I present uh, here, so I'm gonna uh, you'll have to bear with me. Uh, but uh, uh, I started the presentation by going through. Um, uh, uh, examples that are uh, occurring across the company. As I said, it goes from uh, our communities within, within the, the large company that are more in the sustainability camp, all the way to uh, colleagues that are more in the computational camp. So the first one up here is Stuart. Stuart uh, is uh, a director in our Berlin office and uh, uh, he uh, was invited, uh, uh, we invited, uh, celebrated his uh, uh, work uh, in, a, in an event at which I'm going to give you the details soon. And uh, um, as uh, Birgul mentioned, uh, we have to move from a, a, a as, as designers, we have to move uh, from a, a current uh, state of extraction to a state of uh, uh, reuse and uh, use waste as a resource. Now I'm going to rattle you through this uh, story. If you want the full story, I'll give you the link uh, from uh, Stuart. Again, I, I hope that you guys are, um, uh, I assume that you, uh, if you want to spend more time, you can, you can do that. Uh, Stuart beautifully uh, put uh, the, same, the same diagram that uh, Birgul showed us, which says that uh, uh, the, op the operational carbon uh, is three times the, roughly speaking, the embodied carbon in our built environment, which incidentally is uh, higher than uh, uh, the, air, uh, the airline industry, which we all think is so bad, uh, which it is. Uh, the context is that uh, uh, the, we just uh, heard the story over and over at COP last in, earlier this month. Arup uh, was technical advisor to the conference and, and uh, our chairman committed the company to measure um, carbon on every uh, one of our, building, of our buildings. The company has 35,000 projects ongoing design projects ongoing at any point in time. So this is a big commitment. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the, if there is the famous say that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. 
So measuring is a, is a really important part, and we are doing this already uh, uh, in uh, in you know every time any project is presented internally, uh, the question always comes, especially from your generation, the generation uh, let's say the next generation from mine that says so. What was the carbon? Uh, really interesting stories, sometimes counterintuitive. Uh, CLT is more sustainable when it comes from America than if it comes from Austria to the UK, which is uh, the one I heard yesterday. And that's because it's shipped by boat as opposed to road. So there are some, uh, some interesting uh, uh, aspects when you start doing that. Uh, uh, Stuart talks about the circular building. This is a 2015 uh, project. Here you see uh, a... Uh, the, the principle behind the building is that every object in the building is part uh, of a, a, a construction is inserted into a database so that then it can be reused. Um, one Arup was a founding member of Madaster. Madaster is a catasto. I don't know the Turkish word for catasto, but uh, for, uh, uh, for materials as opposed to for buildings. Uh, and is one of the uh, and is open source and is one of the uh, initiatives uh, the, uh, that uh, that are uh, towards uh, uh, this idea of capturing reality and storing it. You hear uh, more uh, in the in the circular building uh, here that was in central London for three months. Uh, uh, we had uh, um, the columns that were reused from uh, a an Arup building site. Uh, and uh, this is uh, currently, I understand that 5% of steel, uh, it is actually reused, which is a lot, but is still a very small percentage. Uh, uh, Stuart makes a really interesting point on, on this shape. You see this building is like very generic, is like a box, an empty box. And this is, uh, uh, he says that, uh, uh, if you put your empty box up on uh, on a platform uh, such as Airbnb, uh, you because the the architecture and the design is generic, uh, uh, you will be able to use it in uh, repurpose it in many different ways. So the uh, I think that. Uh, 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 is, a, is a dimension. He, uh, this is, uh, uh, Stuart was presenting in the height of the pandemic and, uh, and the pandemic is, uh, during the pandemic, he was uh, in Berlin where all of the offices, of course, were empty, like in all the major cities across the world. So that, uh, the, the question of how much use you make out of, uh, of an architecture is also part of, of Circular. Uh, here uh, in this image, uh, you, you see uh, uh, the interior of the building when it was built, and you see this chair. This is a steel case chair, and uh, steel case was one of the partners, and that chair is circular because it is all screwed and there is no glued portion, so it can be uh, taken apart and separated and reused. If you want to know more, here you have a uh, a link and uh, also a QR code. Of course, QR code being the connection between uh, the virtual world and the physical world. Moving on to uh, Kauser. Kauser and Karin uh, have, uh, uh, are from South Africa. Uh, in our uh, Cape Town office, they came up with this uh, uh, idea of uh, using a WhatsApp uh, group uh, and this goes back to uh, uh, Birgus uh, mentioned about the role of the architect. So these are two uh, awesome designers and they are uh, actually, uh, they, they actually used their position in order to connect the, uh, the, the informal settlements construction people with the formal settlements uh, excess of the building site. So some statistics, I'm gonna accelerate through my slides. And, and so what they are enabled is that they used, as you can see here from a, an Arab construction site, they used, uh, they had the uh, shutter boats used for a, a furniture and also 
the, the, the material once the construction was finished was donated. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first pilot was uh, this uh, load uh, they have uh, at which it turned into a, a floor and, uh, and a table in the informal settlements. So from the formal to the informal, you can see the, on top of the technical advantages of circuit, you also see the impact on, uh, on, social, on the social side, which is very beautiful. Uh, I hear from Karin that they have uh, now um, moved the five tons of material, which is very little uh, compared to the five million that is available, but it is a, start, a, step, a starting point. They are uh, uh, their um, their WhatsApp group has turned is turning into a platform. They are at that stage of the of the uh, roadmap, and uh, their uh, their business model is literally using the power of designers, the position of designers to connect uh, uh, the to the two sectors and to connect those that are uh, in uh, that have a way a spare material with those that need it. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, more. Uh, uh, you can you can watch uh, uh, Karen and Kauser uh, presenting their uh, their story, and uh, and please do get involved. Uh, moving on, uh, 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 another uh, uh, seminal project uh, is uh, the wood chip barn. This is a, a also 2016 2015. Uh, project. Uh, um, uh, this is the Architectural Association School, uh, is an historic project here. The idea is that uh, in, uh, you can uh, uh, design, as in the wood, uh, wood chip barn uh, roof, you can design with uh, natural materials. And you see on the right hand side uh, the, um, the scanning of the forest. Uh, this is by no means a new technique. Uh, in uh, in East Africa and Zanzibar, when a, a child is born, uh, you also plant a tree or a series of trees so that then when the child uh, turns 20, the tree is big enough in order to create the, uh, the components uh, to make his, the fishing boat, which is the base of his li livelihood. So uh, it, uh, the, the project at, the, at Hook Park, it, it was just scaling this up. Um, uh, here uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, an example. I, I just want to show you a, an image. This is uh, not out of work. Is uh, MIT working with NASA at uh, developing an, a new aircraft wing? Uh, the the importance of this project, in my opinion, is that uh, a lot of digital fabrication is the uh, what is it called? The simple assembly of complex components. Uh, and there is a lot of theory behind it, reducing from uh, 3000 components in an engine part to, to maybe five. Uh, here, what, uh, what MIT and NASA are exploring is uh, the, complex uh, uh, the complex assembly of simple parts. Uh, um, and, uh, and this is uh, a very much, uh, a necessity if you want to, of course, uh, uh, disassemble it. Also, incidentally, uh, the project says that is the way nature does wings. Um, more of that uh, on the on this uh, publication, uh, uh, recent publication on designing with digital fabrication. Uh, now, I brought in this uh, project. Uh, to explain uh, how, um, how generative design uh, may come of help. So uh, Shibo, our colleague in Amsterdam, working with the Studio Rap Architects, uh, uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, were uh, under construction for this uh, um, uh, acoustical wall in a, in a concert hall. And uh, the acoustical wall is uh, designed uh, with, oops, I went backwards. Uh, is designed with sound, so you can see the the reverberation uh, uh, here, and uh, and you see the the type of design that uh, Studio Rap came up with. Uh, now the the interesting story from our point of view is that uh, uh, the the workflow 
Shibo made the workflow completely uh, um, digital. And that turned out to be really useful when the pandemic hit and uh, the, the material, this, uh, this uh, panels, uh, uh, are made out of aluminum and they are uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a certain thickness, uh, thickness uh, being influencing, of course, uh, uh, in the reverberation, as well as the structural qualities. When they came to construction, uh, the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, thickness of material, because of the uh, challenges that we are having, and we already had as soon as the pandemic hit and the lockdown hit, uh, we couldn't uh, find, we can source uh, uh, the material of the right thickness. And so there was a panic moment in which the, uh, the team was faced with the, uh, long delays uh, and uh, increasing cost. And so the, the digital design was uh, 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 enabled Shiba to, uh, to modify uh, the design and actually uh, use the 80% of uh, thickness that they had and then uh, redesign uh, some uh, some of the uh, facets in order to be uh, rendered with a, 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 diff, a, a, a small a thinner thickness uh, that uh, that was um, available at the time and to me this idea this is kind of the 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 bit and see, you see the construction. Uh, the project was uh, delivered on time and on budget, despite the height of the pandemic around the, the summer of uh, last year. And uh, uh, the, uh, to me, the, the interesting thing here and the lesson for Circular is that you, as an architect, you set a, an aspirational uh, surface in this case, or an aspirational design, and then you let uh, a machine uh, <clears throat> approximate that design with uh, what, is, uh, um, what is available. We call these designers with off the shelf. Uh, and this uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, the, an area that is uh, is of, of, of great interest in our research. If you want to hear Shibo tell the story in a better way, uh, you can find him here. Uh, uh, moving on to Graham, uh, now we are moving into materials. So Graham uh, uh, is one of our uh, uh, our fellows, a world expert in glass, and he was working on the Lloyd's building, uh, an Arab designed uh, 80s uh, uh, headquarters in London and on the left here in the picture. And what he was, uh, the, he was looking at was this uh, very architectural glass. Uh, what Graham was able to do was to challenge the, the official uh, idea of, of uh, re, uh, you know, throwing away glass and replacing it with the, with the idea of repurposing glass and, and all went well with single glazed when, uh, but of course, all of our facades are double glazed and all of the double glazing is coming to age. And so here is an example in which uh, uh, we can, uh, the, the, we, uh, the, the research is going towards how what can we do with these double glazed units. Uh, the, the, I understand the double glazed units uh, are um, actually uh, recycled currently and uh, about 40%, so the middle of the units away from all of the uh, glue and uh, sealant uh, is recycled and the rest is thrown away. So how can we uh, remove that, uh, that waste uh, uh, and uh, recycle 100% of the glass or even better repurpose the glass so re and here is working with the push corp in texas to to test uh, how can we uh, split the double glazed units how we can uh, remove uh, robotically the uh, the different uh, um, um, I mean, the, the sealant, and how can we even polish? This is our friends in the automotive are already doing that with the uh, windshield. Uh, and so we can uh, take, uh, uh, you know, learn from them. Uh, and, and this would be in a situation where you may actually be able to, uh, to uh, reuse uh, directly the, the pane of glass. Of course, glass is a highly, um, technological material 
and it doesn't uh, the, the the need to replace the double glazed unit is not because of the glass it is because of the uh, failure of the sealant uh, and the failure of the insulating properties more on that uh, in uh, in graham's uh, marshable video i'm uh, accelerating a little bit uh, here uh, you can also see this is another example where uh, a lot of glass was uh, uh, recycled um, and uh, and a whole uh, uh, bit of information I wanted to share. I'm going to move on to a different scale. Uh, and there's a, a couple of more examples. So this one is uh, the city scale. So let's look at it at the city scale. Uh, here, Asan is... Uh, uh, is uh, uh, showing us how uh, uh, we could uh, work together with the developer uh, in central London uh, to reuse uh, an entire building as opposed to be reusing maybe a, an insulated glass unit. Uh, so here we are in front of uh, Portland House, the developer uh, for, couldn't uh, couldn't make business out of this house any longer. So they decided to do something about it. They hired an architect. The architect designed a proposed new tower uh, and uh, uh, which involved the demolition of the existing uh, post-war tower. And, uh, and so uh, at that point, uh, uh, the, uh, the team said, well, what if uh, instead, and sorry, and that building received planning permission. Okay, so the planners have a role too in this uh, transformation, which not always is not always uh, um, uh, they are not always pushing in the right direction. So the planners gave permission to the replacement of the tower, and then the the, the developers said, okay, what? Well, uh, together with the team, they decide they discussed what if we were going to reuse the tower. And reusing the tower uh, has uh, uh, was eventually chosen as an alternative, which is amazing, really. And uh, um, and the reuse of the tower uh, uh, was chosen on the basis of speed. We could uh, provide the the category A offices on the market at a faster. Uh, in in less time than than a complete replacement of the tower. Of course, it has a fantastic uh, impact on on carbon. You see there a prediction of what the um, embodied carbon may uh, the difference may be. And uh, uh, so uh, the, again, computation here was really uh, uh, fundamental because uh, refurbishing buildings uh, uh, towers is really uh, cumbersome. So the, the, the repurpose, uh, the architects uh, uh, suggested that we would add uh, this box of, uh, uh, in order to bring it to today's standard to have the space office spaces that are needed in central London uh, in terms of quality of space and so on. And that me meant that we were going to remove all of the facade components and all of this facade components were not structural but the uh, the team was uh, structural team was concerned that they may actually have uh, an effect on the structural performance especially in terms of wind so what asan was able to do is to put some uh, non intrusive sensors on all of the columns and study the uh, the movement of the tower and therefore developing a, a learned model, a machine learned model that was uh, gave the, the team uh, a lot of confidence, which meant that they reduced the retrofitting of the, uh, of the existing uh, structure, uh, and which reduced cost and also made the equation uh, commercially viable. So the equation is uh, between rebuilt and repurpose. So this, uh, um, this whole story is told by Hassan uh, uh, here, uh, together with uh, another 10 different stories about uh, uh, reuse uh, and repurposing. Uh, finally, uh, at a very large scale, uh, so here we have a, 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 in natural flood management, we have a technique called natural, uh, a nature-based solution called the uh, natural flood management. This is in contrast to big, big uh, uh, walls that protect 
our uh, uh, cities uh, from uh, from floods and they will be more of them these big dams you can actually stop the water at source the challenge is to scale natural uh, flood management uh, so a natural uh, i mean to to, uh, to scale this technique to a, a hundred square kilometer catchment and that's why we uh, bef uh, in the past we uh, uh, when in, in the large schemes we used the uh, big dams so what uh, steve has done is he has uh, taken satellite images he has learned and categorized uh, all of the uh, terrain and he has uh, uh, developed a, a deep understanding back back to this idea of reality capture so a deep understanding of the the features of the terrain uh, this uh, uh, these features uh, have generated uh, a whole lot of opportunities for what we call leaky dams, which are little uh, uh, walls that uh, that are there to uh, stop the flood forming in the first place, and. Uh, and the, the, uh, all of that information uh, was used to generate uh, the position as well as the design of, uh, and a couple of schemes here, you have uh, a couple of options in the picture, the high walls and low walls. Uh, and uh, and that, uh, so this generative design technique uh, uh, provided thousands of, uh, of leaky dumps. So um, here is this idea of using computation to scale up in a nature-based solution at a regional scale. And uh, you can hear the entire story um, here. This uh, this solution is now being applied by our colleagues uh, in uh, in Rajasthan. Uh, and uh, in Rajasthan, the um, the leaky dams are called Bhopal. Uh, sorry, Johad. And the Johads uh, are uh, so. What we provide uh, as a, as a computational team is the is the position of these Johads. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you have to be careful when you put a wall because you may actually flood uh, a, a village upstream. And uh, so the position is uh, is a pretty sophisticated uh, um, uh, piece of information, uh, and uh, um, that uh, needs uh, involves uh, under a good understanding of hydrology. Once you have the position, then you can actually use local materials and local people to build it. Uh, and this is all well and good for uh, um, for India, uh, where there is a, a large quantity. But uh, what we envisaged, and this is the those, this is the final example, is uh, can we uh, once we have this uh, um, once we have this uh, 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 generative design of. Uh, uh, bespoke solutions for thousands of places uh, across the uh, the catchment can we actually work together with robots uh, in order to maybe we envisage here on this in this uh, piece in this perspective we envisage a, an e-beaver so the e-beaver will actually work together uh, with the local community, it will have in mind the position of the of the small uh, leaky dam. Uh, it will also have uh, uh, the ability to construct that the beavers have, and we don't really uh, uh, the, a dam. So it will then work together with local population to uh, to fetch. I think it's very difficult for robotics to fetch uh, materials. Uh, to build the, the dam, but it is uh, uh, not difficult to position in an accurate uh, uh, and complex position the, the various bits of materials in order to uh, in order to build. And and this is uh, uh, at the ultimate uh, um, level where you have uh, uh, a nature-based solution enabled at scale by machines. So we talked. I talked about the reality. Uh, uh, and databasing, uh, generative design, you see, so some examples. And, and really the most important thing is uh, to think uh, as a society that uh, repurposing is more beautiful than new and modern, which is a, a concept that is, I think, uh, okay in, uh, in some parts of the Western world, but it is certainly not quite 
there yet uh, in uh, in the rest of the world where still the modernist uh, mental uh, the, the aesthetics is is prevalent so thank you very much and uh, uh, over to you Bigo. I thank you, Aluisa, for giving a really vast range of the examples how do you in Arup tackled some of the circularity uh, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot. We are now going to move to Arzugan and Sorgoch because we are running a bit of the time. So we will have a, at the end the question and answers because there are a couple, two questions uh, addressed, but we will uh, answer that at the end of this session. So, uh, Arzugan, you can... If if you want, if you like to, you can type answers for those questions. Meanwhile, uh, as well. Absolutely. Okay. And I'll ask Raz uh, Razie to tell me which project that she was referring to, or him. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Korai. And I like now, Arzu. I will give the word to you. So, uh, what I would like to talk about is very similar to uh, what actually Berger is explaining about how we approach the design problem. Because um, uh, I'm an engineer, but also I'm in the field of architecture for a long time. And I'm also the director of the Metro Design Factory, where we are really involving in product design. So, um, for me, what's important is to understand the uh, system idea, I think, which is very crucial. And I always approach the problems as systems to be tackled with. Therefore, um, my line of thought uh, will be uh, mostly related with the uh, system thinking today. Um, and um, I was uh, really thinking about the idea of panarchy, um, which is, uh, and maybe uh, outcome of the uh, systems thinking. So, um, but is it an answer to circular design or do we really have a circular design? So uh, I'm not sure about the C in the beginning. And we are um, talking about um, industry for zero, society for zero, architecture for zero. But I think we should also ask uh, what is more? So keeping this in our mind, actually, um, Birgül already explained this. Uh, we have a great shift from linear uh, economy, first to reuse economy. And now, uh, since from 1980s, we are talking about circular economy. And what is different? Actually, the linear economy is a way of um, producing non-recyclable waste. In reuse economy, we have raw materials, and in circular economy, even uh, we don't have it. It's a kind of no landfill uh, uh, approach. So um, when we look at circular economy, which is based on take, make, consume, throw away, we have uh, now digging for um, life cycles, and we are trying to really improve um, the life cycles and afterlife maybe uh, of the uh, components. So uh, again, the whole and component relation is very critical. And I'm asking to myself, what is a circular design, by the way? I'm trying to understand what the circular design is. And in that sense, um, we have to go back to 2002 uh, where um, that was a very nice book, which is maybe uh, one of the manifestos of circular economy, which is Cradle to Cradle, remaking the way we make things. And it's the manifesto proposed by an architect and a chemist. And the, the focus of this book is actually the design. Later, um, an industrial designer, um, Tim Bro, uh, the CEO of uh, IDEO, Define circular design. The purpose is to design products that can be made to be made again, which is quite interesting. So from cradle to grave to cradle to cradle, C to C is an approach in circular design and the idea, no landfill. And product designers are proposing certain um, approaches in designing a circular designed product. You have to design um, a product so that you can emotionally attach. So you will not throw it away. So this is the product design for attachment and trust. 
The product should be durable, which is a physical durability we are talking about, Design for standardization and compatibility. And here, uh, modularity is a key so that you don't have to stick on a single supplier or the supply chain can also be very flexible. Design for ease and maintenance and repair which is quite obvious. And design for upgradability and adaptability. I think that's something that I would like to dwell on because it's also related with somehow resilience, which I will discuss a lot. And of course, design for this and reassembly. However, my question is, is a building an industrial product? I think this is a very crucial question because a building is a system where there are several products, but it's beyond a product because it's the space that we live in it's the binding component between nature and people. And it is one of the major responsibles of natural uh, consumption, consuming um, nature. So uh, I'm questioning again, it's a question to myself. How about architecture? How about buildings? How about cities? And at this point, I remember an English idiom which is someone's uh, trash is someone's uh, is another's um, treasure. I'm just remembering this idiom a lot when I look at all this, you know, rebels. And uh, EPEA, which is a company uh, serving for circular design, uh, there is a very nice uh, uh, statement. It says that. Buildings that become rubble and waste at the end of their life cycle have a design problem. So actually, um, that's the uh, origin that I would like to depart from. Uh, and I believe that this is true. And if uh, a building becomes a rubble, then we have a problem. So uh, again, I go back to my line of thoughts. And I will go back to nature strategies in building design. And I would like to revisit nature as the system or systems. But nature as the system actually teaches us a lot. And it is usually coded as the components and interrelations. So when I go back to uh, buildings as systems or system, um, let's remember what the system is and what the systems is. So um, the basic definition if I, um, uh, provided by Kast and uh, Rosenweg is a system uh, is composed of interrelated parts or elements. Bartelanfi defined a system as model of general nature. that is a conceptual analog of certain rather universal traits of observed entities. But the distinction I think is also very important because the distinction between a system and the systems, the former represents the whole, the latter makes up the whole. So at this point, how we will understand the systems, how we will decode it and which level we have to analyze and what are the interrelations can be qualitatively and quantitatively measured down. And actually this is a very uh, classical question that we try to answer in computational design. And I always have a technocentric point of view, by the way, uh, I have to admit that in my discussions. So there are several approaches and um, based on this idea, um, new science branches, even new sciences are, uh, uh, are blooming. And one of them is uh, known as coupled human nature sciences. Uh, in short, it is known as chance, um, providing a holistic perspective to integrate patterns and processes that connect human and natural system, as well as within scale and cross scale interactions and feedbacks between human and natural components of such systems. An integrated framework to understand the increased complexity of the Anthropocene and develop innovative solutions to unprecedented global changes. I think that's quite interesting because we live in nature, we are a part of nature, and architecture is a part of it. 
but at the end, still we are looking for some relations because um, I think we lost this uh, cross scale relations or within scale relations. And I think this is the key term that I would like to talk about. So uh, panarchy is a term, is a metaphor, um, can help us to understand this complexity and can provide us to uh, uh, develop new circular design strategies? That's the question that I have. Actually, um, panarchy as a term dates back to the end of 19th century to describe a form of governance. And then in uh, 20th century, um, it is used to understand biospheric uh, well being. But in um, 21st century, it changed its meaning and um, it is used under the realm of uh, systems thinking. And it's actually the interplay between change and persistence, between predictable and unpredictable. Um, and um, basically it emerges from three core concepts, ecology and complex systems, technology and politics. So um, I will use panarchy in that realm as well, um, just to understand the unpredictability even in circular economy. So um, panarchy is a framework and it characterizes complex systems of people and nature. And uh, as dynamically these systems organized and structured within and cross scales of space and time. I think this is the essence of building life cycle management and design for after life cycle. So I will again keep this in my mind. Um, the cross scale relation, I think, is very, uh, very important. And understanding what a cross scale, uh, within scale relation is one of the essences uh, if we would like to really develop a strategy for circular design. And in nature, we have many cross scale relations. Uh, from local to global, from micro to macro, and from temporal to special, these uh, cross-scale relations are changing. So keeping this in our mind, Holling um, and Gundarsson um, also question a very important, actually, uh, concept, resilience, which we hear more and more a lot. What is resilience? Is this something good or bad? And in their book, which is also one of the uh, key manifestos of panarchy in terms of human and um, uh, nature relation, um, they have these key um, concepts, mathematics and metaphors of stability, resilience and change, cross-scale interactions occur in nature, adaptive change and learning in transformations, an integrative theory to understand the changes occurring globally, transformative source and role of change in systems, and at the end, they end up with questioning resilience again. So if I would like to uh, summarize panarchy, um, it's not maybe that easy because there are so many implementations and so many uh, uh, different approaches, but in essence, it uses a system approach to understand ecosystem dynamics and emphasizes hierarchical structuring. But the key part, um, how they envision hierarchies is quite different than classical hierarchy theory. And what they say, um, control in a system is not just exerted by larger scale, top-down processes, but can also come from small scale or bottom up processes. Adaptive cycles in that sense differ from more static view of traditional hierarchy theory. Therefore, potential for cycling within adaptive cycles to affect both smaller scales and larger scales, panarchy theory emphasizes cross scale linkages whereby processes at one scale affect those at other scales to influence the overall dynamics of the system. So I can really um, give several examples, but already I uh, uh, show several examples how we can actually understand these cross-scale relations in different ways. And in complex systems, such an ecosystem can be deco decomposed into structural and process elements, 
and they can be defined over a fixed range of special and chandral scales. So this uh, framework um, can be used to understand the uh, design process and the building cycles as well. Um, but we have to remember that uh, what Panaki is uh, a framework, but what it is not, it is not a predictive tool, but it aims to understand adaptive change. And the adaptive cycle is hypothesized to exist within a three-dimensional space defined by three properties, potential, connectivity, and resilience. Connectivity is actually the proxy of the structure of the system. It is the network of interactions and strength between its elements. Resilience is the capacity of any system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to retain essentially the same identity as determined by its native function, structure, and feedback. Um, but I think the term resilience and circular uh, design should be questioned uh, again in this uh, framework. And if we go back to the etymology of the resilience, it's, um, its roots in Latin and it says uh, to jump. Resilio means to jump. And we have two types of resilience actually. Uh, engineering resilience, which is actually an utmost uh, and almost impossible uh, thing. And the goal is to return what is uh, considered as the original state. However, adaptive resilience uh, is related with the capacity of to be reorganized into different operating structure while maintaining functions. And it is what we have in our daily life after COVID, for example. It's a very good example because the normal or the original state is completely changed. We adapt, we reorganize. And this is also true for products. So we can really use this approach in many different fields. And, and the critical question is in resilience, which parts? can be permitted to fail, which parts are critical, and, must, uh, and must, uh, which, which parts must remain intact. Therefore, resilience to which extent, resilience of what, and resilience to what should be the questions. And for this, um, they, we can understand the adaptive cycle. This is what nature usually does. And um, this adaptive cycle idea or the concept is derived uh, from the dynamics of ecosystems and it has states, uh, states like growth or exploitation, conservation, collapse and reorganization. Actually this schema uh, is quite frequently used in urban planning nowadays and especially starting from 2015 you can find many interesting PhD and master studies in urban planning using Panarchy theory and uh, adaptive cycles. And actually, um, this adaptive cycle uh, metaphor is used, or model is used to understand um, the, the, the long periods and short periods, special and temporal uh, relations. And in Gundersen's and Holling's adaptive cycle uh, metaphor, what we have is a qualitative description of the development of a complex, dynamic, evolving system. So evolving is the key idea because uh, the built environment is evolving. The buildings are evolving. Systems are evolving if we uh, pursue this idea. So a complex system alternately passes through phases of stability and predictability and phases of reorganization and stochasticity. So I can really project this idea to circular design and life cycle management of a building and after life cycle, I believe. And in adaptive cycling systems, um, the, the phases are interconnected in cross scale within scale way. Therefore, they're not really completely maybe circular, which are closed, but actually there's a continuous uh, growth uh, uh, and flow from one scale to another, uh, triggering uh, uh, the collapse, conservation, reorganization. So these phases are studied by uh, many 
uh, uh, researchers. So the first loop of the cycle relates to emergence, development, and stabilization of the systems. The second loop relates to their eventual rigidification and decline. And uh, omega symbol for creative destruction phase to denote the end of phase, followed by an alpha phase of organization and renewal. So this is actually related with resilience and resilience of the systems. What is interesting comes from um, an article in uh, Nature uh, in 2020, which was a, a scientific report, a report. Can we compute an adaptive cycle? I think this is the most interesting part for me, because if I can compute, then I can compute and foresee the life cycle of my buildings. That was the question. So um, in their approach, the concept of interactions can be estimated from any kind of time series data reflecting the outcome of interaction among agents. And uh, basis for quantifying potential connectedness and resilience independently of the concrete instantiation of the system. There is only one condition. Um, this is for a given period of time and for every component of the system, a time series of quantitative data reflecting the outcome of interactions exist. So data matters. And here, uh, I remember Birgül, we had a, a discussion two years ago. I wish buildings could be airplanes. Uh, I wish uh, uh, we approach the design problems and the, uh, the, the uh, assemblies in that precision and in that uh, structured way. So, uh, being circular is not that easy, like being green. Design matters. Designing building is a uh, uh, designing a system actually, not a product. So uh, it comprises uh, several subsystems, several products. And at the end, buildings is not a, a product for me. Uh, it's the structure itself of the complex system. Uh, containing uh, several subsystems. And it's um, usually if you begin to design with very wicked problems, try to make them uh, uh, ill-defined and then try to make them uh, well-defined, but still uh, full with uh, unpredictability in the life cycle of the uh, buildings. So uh, regarding this, we should think about the uh, resilience for more time in every scale, starting from the simple small scale to buildings, buildings to cities, cities to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the world. So designing adaptable, uh, designing adaptable structures that can learn from their environments and sustain life, even in the face of disaster, is a part of the resilience idea. And resilience means architects can learn from their buildings and deploy ever more refined designs. And resilience means involving people directly in the design and creation of strong and inclusive cities. That's a very uh, you know, uh, uh, broader definition. But as the design uh, itself, we have to control interconnectedness and understand each and every part. Therefore, uh, designing for uh, circular economy and circularity, um, building life cycle management, BIM, uh, is one of the uh, 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 way to control, and many people is dealing with uh, building life cycle management, BLM. But usually, this cycle ends uh, with demolition. However, what I believe, demolition is not the end. There should be another relation, maybe another circle, maybe another sort, uh, a set of circles, so that we should understand each and every phase, the circularity uh, in the construction logistics, in the uh, connections, in IoT, in renovations, etc. So it's not really circular. But I believe circular design is not really circular, but it is beyond. I don't know how I should read this. I replace C again with this infinity symbol, which is a more flowing, um, flowy direction. But what I believe buildings are mediating systems between nature and people. Buildings are also one of the uh, major um, 
actors consuming natural resources, buildings are systems. So uh, we need new mindsets in design processes, and we need to understand what building is in the human nature ecosystem. Um, there are many new terms like uh, uh, material scouting, uh, circular engineering, um, material harvesting, garbage harvesting. Um, these are all attempts to create and contribute to circular economy and circular designs. I wish, or if buildings could be airplanes, probably uh, we should understand life cycles of each and every component we can control and we can really foresee what is life cycle and after life cycle, which is, I believe, very crucial for circular design. So I think that's all from me. Um, I tried to summarize, but the idea is to use still the systems and the uh, quantitatively and uh, quantitatively model life cycles and their interrelations so that we can really have a more circular uh, designed environment. Thanks, guys. Ooh, okay, Arzu, thank you very much. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Then I will speak. And <laughs> anyway, that's. Uh, I would like to thank you, Arzu, for this very technical background. How to tackle uh, circularity in terms of the race theories. And now, before giving the words, I think do we have any questions on Korai on the question and answer dialog box? Uh, no, we don't have anything. Yeah, for, at the uh, end we will leave for that. Yes. Okay, we will leave the question and answer for the end. Before I leave, uh, give the words to Dominic uh, from IKEA, uh, actually uh, based on the Alvites real life examples of circularity applied circularity approaches and Arzu's theoretical background uh, of the circularity. And I think IKEA Dominic will speak about the difficulties of the circular design applications uh, in the one of the, the world's biggest uh, furniture company who is known, very well known with the adaptable uh, and assembled and disassembled uh, furniture, which we believe that is the, the, the closest uh, furniture industry that could apply circularity in the real uh, environment. But uh, I will, from this point on, I will leave the uh, word to the Dominic that will uh, either support or uh, diminish the, uh, my last uh, sentence. <laughs> it's yours, Dominic. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I just just want to say thank you for for including us in this incredible discussion um, and for both speakers prior to me to really giving a fantastic context for my presentation because what i hear in in both presentations is that we are really grappling with the same questions and no matter where within the system we are these questions are equally important and that is how do we design for circularity how do we eliminate waste out of the system how do we actually enable systems thinking and how do we do it at scale? So I hope in my presentation, I'll be able to give you a little bit more um, practical application to what it means to start working in this. Um, and let's see, we have my presentation here and I hope you can see it. And I see that I'm actually gone. There we go. Um, so within the, the scope of IKEA, we have been working with sustainable strategies for many, many years, and we have a very strong guiding principle, both uh, established in our people and plant positive strategy, but also it, more foundationally within our values and our overall vision. And our over, overall vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And now it's becoming much more clear to us that we need to do this within the boundaries of the planet. And we believe that one way to do this is to actually adopt a circular uh, way of thinking in our business. And just to give you a, a sense of what we are talking about uh, in terms of scale, our reach is quite significant. Uh, we have quite a high turnover. We operate in uh, more than 52 markets. And our goal by 2030 is to, to actually reach and interact directly with 3 billion people. So more than just welcome, welcoming them to our channels, but actually having 
um, some kind of a transaction with those, meaning that our scale is significant. And therefore, if we can really adopt a circular system, we really enable a, a great many people to be part of that uh, system as well. And beyond that, we're also talking about a complete value chain. And for IKEA, we are uh, perhaps in, in a fantastic position to be able to go beyond just having sales channels, because for us, it is a complete value chain, meaning that we are responsible for our own sourcing of materials, production, distribution, um, sales, and uh, uh, the commercial activities as well. So why do we want to go into a circular uh, business model? And for that, I will share with you a little video that will give you the background inspiration for what we want to do. If we take a look around at how we live today, what do we see? Well, we see a world of rapid climate change, dwindling resources, and unsustainable consumption. A linear world where raw materials are turned into products that are eventually turned into waste. What a waste. What if there was a better way? We've talked to people all around the world and we know for a fact that nobody really wants to be wasteful. But the world today is not set up to make a new resourceful way of living easy. IKEA wants to change that. What if new things could be made from old things? Then products wouldn't just be products. They would be resources, material banks for the future. But before we can even think about doing that, so much more needs to happen. Like designing products so that we can easily repair, renew, or upgrade them and making sure it's easy for every single piece to be repurposed or remanufactured, and then, at the very end, recycled. Things would last so much longer, and we could all play our part by reselling or passing them on, moving us closer to a world without waste. We need a new mindset, a new way to make products live multiple lives. At IKEA, we're committed to transforming our complete business to become circular so that we can make it easier for people to live better and more sustainable lives with the products we make. Until one day they are needed somewhere else by someone else as something else entirely. If there we go. So I hope that you found that idea, that, that video to be really inspiring. And I think it really echoes uh, what the two previous speakers have talked about. Um, it's this idea of really enabling every single product that we put out there, whether it is a piece of furniture or a building to become a material bank for the future. So this change in mindset really puts brand new prerequisites on how we are thinking about design. And for IKEA, anyone who has ever interacted with IKEA, it, it's very clear that for the past 75 years, we've really become champions of a linear business model, where we take resources, we manufacture something, we distribute it, and then we sell it off to our customers. And then we don't really interact with those products afterwards. And we've really hyper-optimized that value chain. So changing to this system of circular thinking is a really complex undertaking. Um, especially when you're talking about the scale of our business. So in order for us to be able to grapple with the normity of that change, we've tried to distill it into very concrete uh, goals. And we've really reduced it to four ambitions. We want to make sure that we are enabling reuse, which is very much about the interaction of our products with our customers, very close to the customer home. It is about refurbishment. How do we as a business really support the prolongation of the life of the products, not, not necessarily in the customer's home, but um, in outside environment, uh, maybe in refurbishment centers. Then we, what does this, how can this influence our possibility to remanufacture and how can we harvest components from old products that can no longer be refurbished into new products? And then at the very last step into walking into recycling. 
And our focus today in terms of development is very much focused on reuse and refurbishment, because this is where, number one, we have the greatest possibility to maintain the value of the, of the products and the materials that are already in circulation. But secondly, it really gives us a possibility to, to extend the relationship that we have with people. Um, and what's been really interesting is this question of, of language in this conversation, because what I see very slowly emerging in the conversation internally within, uh, within IKEA, but also in our conversations with our collaboration partners like Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is that today we're starting to question what would happen if we stopped calling our customers customers, because customers and consumers have a tendency of having a somewhat negative perception, meaning that we're consuming and using up things, and start talking about all these people that interact with these products um, as users, because that really starts to shift a way of thinking of what happens in these loops of reuse and refurbishment. So I think it's interesting to follow also the language that is being associated with the circular development. But slicing the development of a business into actually transforming it so uh, fundamentally uh, for IKEA means that we actually have to, as there's a saying in, in the Swedish that you have to slice the elephant. Um, and for us, that equals four slices. Um, one is how do we actually develop a possibility to have a different relationship with our customers slash users to enable them to acquire care for and pass on products in circular ways, because they are an integral element in this whole entire ecosystem of these material um, banks floating around. How do we actually set up a precondition for every product to allow uh, that possibility to flow through those circular loops? What materials do we bring into the system? And we have a very strong ambition to use only renewable recycled materials. And to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how difficult this is, um, we're working with many categories of materials here. And already today, when we have done our assessment, we know that there are materials that will never be able to reach this goal. So our job now is to not only transition in the materials that we have, but also work towards innovation of materials. Um, here we have a really good example of, for example, working with the uh, H&M on uh, sourcing recycled textiles, um, where we know that we have an incredible issue with legacy chemicals um, and uh, the possibility to actually measure where those textiles are coming from so that when they are recycled, we can secure that they are safe and that they are of the right quality becomes really difficult. So tests like the ones that we do with um, H&M really help us set up a possibility to track materials and through the whole entire system. So this digital possibility to track becomes incredibly important in the system. And of course, because this is a systemic change, it's not about IKEA doing something on their own, because if we do, if we design every product to be circular and we only use renewable recycled materials and it all ends up in a landfill, then in a way we have failed. So it becomes really important that we also connect to everyone else who is working in the system to make sure that we make the change and build up environments are integral uh, aspect of this. Um, so how do we actually engage with customers in new circular ways? Uh, today, what we are exploring is the possibility to move beyond a sale of just new products and look at how we can enable um, customers to prolong the life of their products, meaning how do they care for it? Um, how can they repair? Um, how do we uh, adapt products so they can live through many different changing stages of life? Um, and what that means is that we are designing every product from the very beginning to be reused, repurposed, repaired, and then at the end, recycled. And our journey into designing circular products has been a very interesting one because our first circular design guide was published um, four years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And at the time when we published that first guide, it was essentially um, what we thought was a very good document, but, but in hindsight, it was actually just a, a document that helped us understand what circularity in the product design could mean. And what we run, where we ran into the problems was that those design principles helped us understand circularity better, but didn't necessarily translate into what a, designing a circular product meant. So from a product developer perspective, from an engineering perspective, 
those principles were not translatable into actions and could not be followed up. So then we went into a second version of this, working with a group of designers who helped us understand what their dilemmas were in product design. And we did, created an updated version. And that updated version was ended up being more of a checklist. Um, you should consider X, Y, and Z when you're designing a product. And what we actually found is that in a way we've got, we went from ditch to ditch. We became too prescriptive. Um, that checklist really limited people's thinking in terms of how do you interpret design into creating a capab circular capability in the product. It became a to-do list, meaning that it went too far and it um, limited the possibility for innovation and creativity. So the design guide that we have today is a blend of those two elements, understanding what circularity in its core is and how to interpret that into designing um, circular products that actually enable circular flows. And through that work, what we've actually done is we have designed circular design recipes because what we have understood is that our design principles, which are here, designing for standardization, renew designing for renewable recycled materials, disassembly and reassembly, adaptability, care, repair, remanufacturing and recycling, don't actually apply to every single possibility of what that product can do in terms of reuse, refurbishment, remanufacturing and recycling. So in that, in the process of understanding these design principles, we actually realized that some principles are extremely crucial for reuse. Others are important for refurbishment. Some will apply for remanufacturing and only a few will actually apply for recycling. So when it comes to thinking about the potential, circular potential of a product, what we've realized is that thinking about what is their poss possible lifespan and how many lives they can live in the, during that life actually dictates what kind of a design recipe needs to be used. And in terms of understanding the design principles themselves, we've gone through an evolution there as well. So if I can give a little anecdotal story of designing for disassembly and reassembly. In the original guide, the, this original principle was actually designing for assembly and disassembly. And as we started to apply that to, to what capability it means to actually help products be adapted and uh, uh, changed over time or repaired, we realized that we already do as IKEA assembly extremely well. That is, that is the foundation of the way that we design our products. But what we actually need to transition to is make it possible for those products to be reassembled and function as new as they do before they have been disassembled. And that is a, you know, seems like a no brainer today, but it is actually representing a, a monumental shift in thinking about what product design um, that enables circularity actually means. And what we've also found is that there is two principles in the whole entire thinking around uh, circular design that are universally applicable to, to all types of products. And they have to be thought of before we even define a recipe for circular design. And that is, as I mentioned, defining a product lifespan. What kind of, how will our products be used? What do we expect from the everyday life of a product in an everyday life of a, of a person who uses that? And that is translated into our wished business opportunity and understanding the human behavior and understanding what we can do in terms of supporting that lifespan of a product can translate into a product design recipe. We also cannot underestimate the emotional connection to the product because we know that there are many reasons why people keep products and not throw them away. Some of them is because they have invested money into that product and it's expensive or they cannot afford to replace that product. Some people have an, uh, an emotional connection to that product because it represents memories or connections to loved ones. And, and more foundationally, what we really understand is that doesn't matter what socioeconomic background people come from, nobody wants to throw things away that they feel still has value. And that is an interesting potential for us. So we have actually gone through a, a process of uh, understanding what more than 9,500 articles in our product offer, which ranges from napkins to uh, plates, uh, lamps, uh, um, uh, armchairs, sofas, uh, storage units. We have assessed them against our design principles. So now we have a, a exact number of products which actually comply with our circular design principles 
and where we have work to do. And there are kind of key lessons that we have learned that, that are really uh, applicable to all our complete offer. And one first one, which is a bit of an aha moment, is that there is no one size, size fits all for circular product development recipe. Because the way that we design circularity into a plate or into a sofa is vastly different than one that we would use to design for a storage unit or a lamp. And that is a very important um, uh, understanding because it means that we have to be really flexible in the way that we apply our design principles. Also, being able to choose a renewable or recycled material and designing for recyclability are huge contributors to the product's circularity and its climate capability. Without understanding those elements, we cannot actually make a positive impact in our design. Standardized fittings and spare parts availability are key contributors to enabling repair and refurbishment. And they're actually one of the entry points into the possibility for customers as individuals to have an impact as well, because these are the things that will help them repair the products that they already have today, meaning that they are able to prolong the life of those products. And expected lifespan and intended use is needed from the very beginning of the design process to establish relevant circular design principles for the product. And understanding those elements becomes really critical in the way that we shape and formulate recipes for our products. And before I, uh, I finish my presentation, even though I have uh, uh, finished the presentation itself, I wanted to um, uh, I want to reflect a little bit on some of the pilots that we have done as IKEA, because today we're actually trying to understand what happens to our products when they are sent out into the world and what, what capability do we need in order to, for those products to actually live through those reuse and refurbishment uh, to, uh, loops. And today we are doing one interesting uh, um, uh, pilot in Poland where we're actually making spare parts available to customers. And when we say spare parts, we're talking more than just screws and spare covers. We're actually talking about new cushions and armrests. And what we see is that there is a real demand for this from the customers, and they are willing to pay for those spare parts because they want to keep the, the, the um, products in use. And for example, like a sofa, they're not really interested in dragging a sofa, you know, out their house and back into the store to buy a new one. They just want to be able to quickly fix it. Another thing that we, we are beginning to understand is what does it actually take logistically to enable refurbishment activities? So in one of the refurbishment uh, um, pilots that we have done, we actually tried to get products from customers bring them back to a refurbishment center, which in our case was a supplier, which had the capability to refurbish. And in that process, one of the things that we have learned is that, for example, the trucks that are able to pick up products in cities need to be quite small because you need to be to, able to navigate uh, tight streets. But our uh, refurbishment centers, which are suppliers, which have loading docks, have loading docks that are too tall for those trucks. Meaning that in order to get that sofa off that truck, we are actually requiring manual lifting and labor, which creates costs. So from a perspective of actually being able to make this a viable business model, it's these kinds of nuances in making this model work that become really interesting to address because we have to create that optimization, which we have done so well in a linear chain into a circular uh, chain as well. So here is where that intersection between architecture and building actually becomes incredibly important because we can design furniture to be circular, but if it means that it's creating costs along the, the way, then it becomes very difficult for us to maintain that as a, as a good business model, which means that prices rise for our customers, which then means that sustainability becomes unaffordable. And our main goal here is to really make sure that it is not coming at a premium, that we are actually able to make sustainable choices affordable for everyone. Because we know that it's especially those who have thin wallets that actually need this the most. So that is a, hopefully a little bit of a glimpse of how we are trying to tackle this complexity within our system. Um, and it is something that we are learning a great deal about uh, every day. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you have. And I also will share in the Q&A um, a tool that we have published recently, which is that you can yourself assess the circularity of any product that you have at home through our online tool, which is super cool because then you get a circularity score at the end. 
So fun way to interact with the circular design. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dominic, which very inspiring uh, presentation. And the, this, the struggle uh, that you are dealing with the circularity uh, transition in your company, I think Inkea is the one of the best examples that you can do uh, pursue this circularity because from the product uh, itself, from, to, from the material itself towards the end of the life, you are in the process generating that product and creating it. So uh, your experience actually experiences will uh, lighten up uh, other industries as well, how to pursue this uh, change. And I'm, I would like to also inform our audience that you mentioned the materials as a, a design products as mm -hmm. Banks will be a presentation this afternoon about the buildings as material bank, which is EU project uh, conducted by Elna Durishevich, which actually points out some of your uh, questions that you raised here. So before I ask a question, I would like to uh, if there are any questions from the audience, question and answer. Uh, there is one, I think, from Techly Voin Haley, uh, and uh, he or she asked, that, is there a studied way of controlling the emission of different gas that may harm the environment during the process of recycling and reusing the reusing of materials? Uh, if that is related to IKEA's uh, presentation. Yeah, I think, is there a studied way of controlling the emissions of different uh, gas that, this is a very complex question. And I think one that is not unique to IKEA because understanding exactly what is happening uh, with emissions uh, during recycling and reusing is extremely complicated because we're talking about a very, many different players having to act in this field. Um, it is something that we are trying to address and figure out how to calculate. It hasn't been easy because it also requires a great deal of traceability. Um, and it often requires a bill of materials. So it is on our to-do list. We have not answered that question yet today, um, but it is within our ambition to be able to do that for every single product and the loops that uh, they follow. Also, yeah. we have another question, Dominic, if you mm -hmm. allow me to ask. Yeah. From Srini Raharjo. Uh, he, has, he, he wants to discuss, but we can also uh, quest, answer the question. How is the hierarchy of the IKEA IKEA circular. Uh, Can you clarify the question? Because I'm not sure what what you would what you maybe he can we can he can uh, more um, comment on his own question and we can uh, discuss it through the uh, all Q and A session with all panelists. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... Yeah. If so I add spotlight to every panelist, Professor, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, a, a Dominic, you actually, following your presentation, I realized that, that the business model, actually, you are in the process of changing your business model as well, uh, as toward the circular economy. So this is not only the design issue, but the issue of different levels that needs to be tackled really in, in the process. And uh, it, what is the, like how we can really uh, uh, define the designer's role in this? Because we are really not, as I mentioned, like we are not expected to be uh, to, uh, to action in these levels. We are basically very good in creating the designs and being innovative and uh, 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 generating uh, new things. But I think our level is switching towards this more um, higher level to be in, mm. back in decisions phase. So what is your uh, group uh, approach like with the design group and with the manufacturing, like how you actually define your designer's uh, position in this all circularity uh, business? I think there's, there's two answers to that. I think one is the kind of foundational mindset change that needs to happen. And it doesn't matter whether you're a design team or whether you're working on a supply chain or anywhere else. And that is, you, that is becoming aware of the fact that you're working within a system and that the, the decisions that you make within your own scope of work actually has implications on the entire system because the capability that you can put into the material or into the product or into the supply chain solution 
actually either enables or hinders the possibility for, for the circular flows. So, so that's a really big shift in the way of thinking. It's no longer just, I do my work and then things will happen. You have to be aware of what's happening, what, what, what grand scheme of things is, is around you. Um, the other one is, is to actually really be able to understand um, what does it take for a product to move through that system? Um, and what implications that has in um, behaviors of the different players. Uh, so for example, how will the customer, once they receive that product, actually treat that product and design for a realistic um, use of those products. So I think, because I think one of the, the, the issues that we have is that we can get very excited about this and start to design really fantastic and uh, visionary things. But at the end of the day, if they're too complex, and they're not following the life of, of an everyday person who is you know, dealing with taking children home from school and cooking dinner and all those things. If you're not designing for that everyday life reality, then you're not actually going to succeed in, in enabling the circularity of products. So, and, and a good example of that be, it can be um, reusable plastic bags. You know, we have we have made plastic bags that are of extremely good quality that can be used many times over. But we know that one of the biggest realities is that people just don't have time to clean plastic bags. So what is an alternative solution to that that can help them store food more efficiently, but also to, to enable people to everyday life very quickly, prolong the product uh, life of, of that whatever solution is for that food. So, so I think it's understanding life and product use that is absolutely essential for any of the design team. Thank you. But th th this actually, these approaches are also for architecture. If you go back to architecture business and our AEC construction industry, I think all the questions that are raised by Dominic are tackled us as well. We are we have to think in this manner about the buildings, but not as as only products that Arzu mentioned. There are other dimensions into that as well. But our industry is so fragmented. It's not like IKEA that covers everything. So it, a construction industry is like a waste of a very fragmented industry with the many many different partners. And what will be our approach for the future? Like, how is the easiest way to tackle these issues in AEC industry or in architectural, uh, say, not industry, but creative business? <laughs> uh, you are mute. Well, thank you. Sorry, I was looking for the button. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, and, uh, uh, for the and Arzu for the presentations, uh, uh, really amazing to see IKEA uh, uh, turning uh, into a, a circular, circular uh, model, and of course the impact, the numbers you show, shared at the beginning, uh, is uh, mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. um, I did I did spend uh, I did do an internship in uh, IKEA design uh, mm -hmm. when I was younger, so I, I have a. a deep love for IKEA. I think uh, in terms of architecture, um, how do I put it? Um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure the uh, fragmentation is a problem uh, for a circular model. You know, this terrible fragmentation of the industry that we have where people uh, do and etc. So, um, uh, I, I think I'm quite excited, actually. Uh, I think that uh, as uh, we, this is a bit controversial, but uh, uh, because as I said, you know, the official future is that you want to industrialize uh, uh, architecture and turn it in, uh, you know, learn from uh, uh, from other industries. Uh, I think that. Uh, um, if we look at uh, a computation as an enhancement of what we are doing, uh, you know, the, I, I think that uh, uh, Dominic uh, mentioned uh, uh, this idea of digital possibility to track mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as the key of all of this. Uh, we have to remember that uh, um, 
circularity in architecture already exists and existed. And in fact, I think outside the Western world, uh, it still exists very much. Uh, I, I, I think you mentioned that there are some colleagues joining from India. They may be laughing at us. Uh, uh, you know, we created the problem in the first place. <laughs> uh, there's an awful lot of circularity if you go around the villages mm -hmm. in India uh, and, uh, and etc. So um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Birgul, is, uh, is to do with this uh, idea that repurposing is, um, is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in Italy. I studied the architecture in Italy. And uh, there was no new construction in Italy, hence me leaving and going to London, where, where the high tech uh, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, and etc., was uh, thriving uh, uh, to practice because it was cool to do uh, new constructions. And, um, and, I, uh, and so I'm a, a culprit of this. Uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, uh, now the with the new goal uh, of the, this new goal of, uh, um, of living in, in harmony with our planet, otherwise we will get kicked out of the planet, uh, is, um, I mean, uh, uh, I think that that, that is actually uh, making uh, uh, a circular approach uh, and, uh, and repurposing a lot uh, more exciting. And the signs of the market are fantastic. So we, as a business, if you look at Europe as a business, actually across both, uh, uh, both the UK and Europe and North America, and probably beyond that, but uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the demand for, uh, for refurbishment and repurposing is, uh, is really good. And, uh, and it makes a story that is really appealing to the new uh, generation, thank God for the new generation. <laughs> that is uh, uh, the last th comment I want to make is in terms of uh, innovation. You know, you said that uh, we architects uh, and designers are really good at innovating. I would uh, challenge that. And I think that uh, we, we do really loads of boring stuff and repeating uh, stuff. I think that uh, this turn, you know, the turn that we, we uh, see described uh, a COP and et cetera, it is an enormous opportunity to innovate mm. because uh, all of a sudden, everything you do is new. You know, what Dominique explained very beautifully, you know, this idea of designing for a, a building for the second use, not his first use, but his second use. Uh, it is uh, a pretty good driver for innovation. And nobody, I can't really think of many people that have done that. Uh, and uh, and so so I think that uh, when I say I, I cannot think of any people that have done that, I'm talking about that at scale. Mm -hmm. You know, we have always reused the components um, in in uh, in our architecture. So I uh, I uh, my position is uh, uh, we have created the problem ourselves. Uh, and uh, if uh, and uh, more in certain societies than others, and so if we go back, uh, Japan I think has a huge tradition in uh, in re repurposing. So long answer, and a, a bit wandering, but uh, uh, yeah, look forward to to more okay. challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I guess it's not, uh, I'm also agree with your comments that in architecture really we do use uh, recycling in, in certain societies and I think the capitalist economy the, uh, and the linear economy who purposed was to make better lives actually shift a bit from the track in the Western society and created the best waste uh, problem in this. So what will be your opinion in the terms of like having an engineering background and architectural educator Arzo and the leading design factory had like how you future the transition towards uh, this new approach? Um, thank you, first of all, both um, Alvisi and Dominique. Um, actually, we are on the same track, I believe, and uh, yeah, I'm, I have engineering backgrounds and I conclude my research as I wish 
uh, the buildings uh, would be planes. What I mean, maybe I have to explain a little bit more. Um, it is related with uh, accuracy and precision in understanding what we are doing. The, the IKEA, for example, the assembly is almost flawless hmm? because we know all the parts and their interactions, connectedness, and we have a story about them. We know their life cycle, we know which part should be uh, changed first and which part should be the second. And actually, this idea is reflected back to the whole design itself. So there is an order. Order. There is a sequence of design, so you can easily dismantle, remantle, etc. I think this is this is something that we have to think. And I agree with uh, Alvis in that sense. The details of the buildings are always the same. We use the same sequences, the same orders, and we never change our minds and questions the way we built the buildings. However, um, if you look at the buildings, how we built them how we really understand the components that we use, where they come, how they, uh, that, what are the manufacturing processes, etc. I think the way we construct the buildings, we mount them together with, would be completely different. And it's also related with, I believe, to understand the system structure interactions. So I look at the buildings, not as products, but also products in, in, uh, in a different scale, maybe. So it's a paradox in itself, but if I uh, keep on carrying the same system idea, and actually Dominique is, uh, what IKEA is doing this, uh, how and when a part should be replaced. For example, if I would like to change the, the, the um, uh, fenestration, the windows, how I will do that? Usually we demolish the wall, take out the frame and usually the frame becomes a rubbish and then we replace it. That shouldn't be the way. So we have to think about how these two different uh, subsystems should be together, how we can put them together so that when we remove it, it will be reused, upgraded or uh, will live longer. So I agree, we have to uh, think the design not only for a life cycle, but after life cycle several life cycles and in which scale, in, in which place, how much, when. So I think that's why I'm using still the complexity theory and I'm trying to quantify the life cycles and try to understand um, their durations. I think this is also very important. So it should be in the genes of the design. So design idea, design uh, approach should also include this. So we have to think after life cycle of the uh, uh, buildings rather than the life cycles. And it's unpredictable sometimes. There are many crises, I agree, but we have tools to identify at least at certain degree. So this is my approach. So as an engineering background, I look at, uh, I feel that buildings should be like airplanes because there's a very strict ordering, but still they consume a lot of uh, natural raw material. This is something else. But the way they approach their design in that flawless uh, sequence is inspiring me a lot. Okay, thank you. Can I just ref sure. share one reflection uh, on what Azra has said? Um, and I can use, going back to the sofa example, I think this idea of systems thinking is really important and it's not just about the parts themselves. It's about what's happening with those parts and who is interacting with those parts. Um, one lesson that we learned in our sofa refurbishment uh, process was that our suppliers knew how to refurbish a sofa. But when the sofa came in and they had to take the cover off and put on a new sofa, they had to measure everything themselves from the very beginning. So as a result of that learning is that now we set, we when we develop new sofas, we also provide the specifications for what that sofa cover should look like. So we don't have an individual standing there measuring each individual sofa. And when I think of your example of what happens with the windows, if we need to change the windows, it's not just about the window itself, but it's also about how do we enable the process of that exchange to happen. Uh, so, so it is, it becomes a little bit more complex, but I think if we, fo if we follow this idea of the system, the answers on what questions we need to uh, address present themselves. And I think that's what's so interesting in this development. 
So mm -hmm. maybe um, I can make a comment on that as well. I, 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 we always think about data and following the processes and collecting data is very important. And now we have a, a kind of culture of understanding what's going on. And I think that's also very important. Although cultural issues changing a lot, still we have some information about it. And uh, we have to be able to really embed such informations in the design processes. And that gives us um, a, a typical uh, uh, foreseeing. Um, a typical learning, uh, a typical example in Turkey is, you know, closing balconies. We have balconies, but we close them with different components. It disturbs me a lot because it's a design failure. It's against the nature of design, but also it's coming within the uh, user. So mm -hmm. there must be a dilemma that we have to solve. This is demolishing actually the uh, idea of the building. It is against the uh, interrelations because you add it and there is no real clue uh, what you have done. So nowadays we have uh, soft closing balconies in Turkey. That's a very good transformation in new buildings. I see that there are components which enable users in a flexibly uh, close and open up buildings. I think such shifts uh, is important in understanding the design and this is emotional design as well that I, I want to keep my balcony as it is in that case and I agree. <laughs> Yeah, it goes back to understanding this human behavior and what we do every day. Exactly. What's our, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. That that I won't look. We, we have passed a bit uh, time, but I think it's a really interesting discussion. So I'm not really uh, pushing to finish at the time. Before we go towards the end, actually, the point of the Dominic about the the users, customers transforming into users is very important in the architecture field as well. As I mentioned, that we are we are designing for one function one static function are buildings. As Arlisa mentioned, there are a lot of innovation opportunities, like why do we don't design buildings in their lifespan if the lifespan is the 75 years of the building decided that one building designed as a school can function 20 years after the uh, finishing the school function turns into the hospital or the, or, or the housing, or and, and, and after 25 years into something else. But since we are designing in static way, we have to really either demolish our buildings, build new ones, or the like refurbishing and transforming them is becoming expensive and we don't do that. So this mind changing mindset of our architects is really, designers is really important in this, uh, in this process. And as being an architect, that's not easy. As you mentioned, Dominic, it's not easy. It requires really to think in all levels, in all levels of the smaller scales to higher scale. But I think this is our uh, duty to do this in order to keep the uh, materials in circularity and uh, to keep sustainable words. So before, if you have any concluding remarks, regard, uh, <laughs> remarks, I will now take, would like to take it. If not, we will conclude our first session in here. And the afternoon session, which will be have a panelist discussing on, let me open the agenda, Circular build environment, some architects, uh, very, very interesting issues that has been raised this morning in our uh, discussions, like buildings as a, like material banks or the retrofit and refurbishing existing building environment, how to make it the circular principles apply to existing building environment and the educational aspects of the circular uh, design approaches will be discussed in afternoon uh, sessions. And then we will have at the end, the, the third session will be discussion about uh, all issues that we have raised today with our panelists who are available to join us. They are, you are welcome to join to the last uh, session of the discussions. So I would like to thank you all of you, Alize, Dominic, Arzo, for really great presentations and your contributions uh, to this symposium. And hopefully we will see you in Istanbul in further our uh, events. <laughs> see you, thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.